kind of share what God's done or doing during that the week? Anyone? Good, good. Sister, you have a good week? Yes, sir. Good, good, good. All right, let me see where I left my uh, iPad and stuff. Well, I'm here. I'm very grateful. Well, we're certainly glad to have you. I don't like being laid up. Yeah, that's right. You weren't feeling well, were you? My, that's right. That was actually quite a bit, wasn't it? time that you weren't feeling well for you. Yeah, I don't um, I think I always prefer to miss the next opportunity for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you were with us last week, you might remember that we were sharing on uh, being able to hear the voice of God. How many of you have had experiences and would like to be able to fine-tune your hearing a little better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I sure would. How many of you had to go back and say, yeah, I guess that wasn't God? Anybody? Um, You've never missed God? Oh my gosh, I gotta sit down. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes the fine-tuning part is the, uh, the learning experience, isn't it? Last week we uh, we went through some scriptures together, and so we're just kind of gonna do this like a like we're sitting down in a Bible study kind of thing. So, um, can we go through First Corinthians back again because we kind of zipped through it last week? And uh, I'm gonna ask you to turn there. That's not where uh, that's gonna be a little recap. But before we do, I want to tell you about experience that I had. Now, I know a lot of you in here speak other languages, not because it's supernatural, but because you're learned in other languages. And so, Cicero, what is what is the language where in your country? Portuguese. Portuguese. Portuguese? Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, Louis? Spanish. Spanish. I also speak Portuguese. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we have French, right? That's from Haiti. French. Yeah. So you guys know lots of different languages between you, and uh, I really only knew uh, English and that fairly well. And then I also spoke a little Spanish when I lived in Miami because I was surrounded by so many Spanish-speaking people that you have to end up learning a little something. Most of what I learned, though, I wouldn't want to repeat because it's all just street talk, you know. Uh, but the other day, I, I work at a restaurant, and uh, every time that we are in the back, every time that we have an order that is kind of fully prepared and ready to be served to the customer, it goes through a little window, and we say, order up. Everybody say, order up. Order up. Okay. That means the people in the front can now come get the order and give it to the rest of the people you know, that, that we're serving. And so uh, we have several different people of different languages working it. And so I thought it would be cute if I, if I learned Arabic for what was order up. And so I asked the guy that worked on the grill, I said, how do you say order up in Arabic? so that I could tell the lady in the front who also speaks Arabic, I said, how, how could I say that? I said, do me a favor though, don't play a joke on me. Don't tell me that, you know, that I'm going to say something that's going to embarrass her or me. So you be straight up with me, right? And she goes, yeah, I'll be, I won't do that to you. I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll treat you right. So, so he told me that and, um, and he, he gave me the word. I'm trying to, trying to find it in my notes here because uh, I, didn't, I, I thought I could remember it, but I couldn't. But anyway, so I said it, and let me see if I can find it here. I said it, and uh, she, she then took it to mean that I actually knew what I was talking about. Oh. And so have you ever done that before? You know a couple words in the language of some, somebody you're talking to. Yeah. They know a lot more words than you do, and you only know a few, but you give out the few you have so authoritatively they actually think that you know what you're talking about. And then they go off on this whole other part of the conversation you have absolutely no idea what they said, which brings it to a screeching halt as you then have to admit, I have no idea what you just said. I just asked this other guy how to say what a rough, and that's about as far as I got in Arabic. But anyway, if you've been there before, then you know how that goes. You start a conversation and the person just 
kind of lights up in their face and they think, you know what you're talking about, I can talk with you. And you're like, oh no, I just started a big problem. <laughs> But uh, anyway, that's, that, was, that was one of those things that brought me to understanding about how I can help us to be able to communicate with God more effectively. You've got to have a vocabulary to work with, don't you? And I know that you would think God knows all your languages. We do. He knows everybody's language. That's not the, the thought. The thought is, how can I distinguish between what is God speaking to me and what is my own you know, awareness, my own conscious, if you will, my own thoughts, how, how do I decipher those things? See, that's where, that's where it's not about what language you speak, it's about what kind of a vocabulary you're using. And in this case, um, the vocabulary of God is actually able to be deposited on the inside of us. See, the more words you know of a language, the better you can communicate to somebody. Isn't that right? Yeah. You know, if I just say order up, I could say that might fit one scenario one time, and that's about it. Every other time of communicating with that person is off limits to me. I don't have a vocabulary. And so I think that if we were to understand that we could actually connect with God better if we had a broader vocabulary of God's vocabulary, then we would be able to communicate more comfortably and more frequently with God. Would you agree? Yes. yes. I mean, if you knew Spanish and you wanted to talk to Lewis in Spanish, wouldn't you think more than... Hola, you know, would be great. Because you open up the conversation with Hola, he smiles, he says, ¿Cómo estás? And you say, muy bien. And then he goes off into something else, like, you know, what brought you here today? And you're kind of like, that's it. You know, I'm out of the conversation. So, likewise, uh, we can actually expand our vocabulary so that we can communicate with God better. And that is very simply done uh, through his word. And I know that it sounds like we should be doing... We should be doing something supernatural in order to get supernatural results. But if you could actually do something natural to get supernatural results, would you do the natural? That's my question. Would you do something simple that you know would help you to grow spiritually, even though it doesn't seem very spiritual? Yes. Yeah. See, because a lot of times we think, well, if it doesn't sound, it doesn't feel, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't feel or it doesn't uh, uh, strike me as spiritual. You know, spirituality would be I would sit silent before God like Job for endless hours and wait for God to speak to me. But the reality is, is that in, in, a, in a friendship and in a communication with God, you're going to have to have, be familiar with the, with the vocabulary of God. And that is literally through his word. So we'll talk about that. I've asked you to turn to uh, 1 Corinthians. Can you just put your finger there? Because it's kind of like a little off topic from last uh, We'd be going back into a little bit of last week's, which is, which is important. But before I, I wanted to finish this thought about communication, because Jesus said, I only say what I hear the Father say, and I only do what I see the Father do. Now, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Because then you ask yourself, how did he see the Father, and how did he hear the Father? You ever ask that this question? I mean, if, he, if that's what he said he only did, then you'd have to ask the question, well, how did he see him? And how did he hear him? And it, it begs the question, does, does Jesus have something? Now, he is somebody that we could never uh, uh, have been. But is whatever he was doing on the earth because he was somebody that we could never be? Or is it because he applied himself 100% to everything we could be? Amen. Do you understand the difference? Yeah. I believe it's because he applied himself to everything 100% that we could be. He gave us an example of what we could do. Even he himself, his words were, you know, the works that I do shall you do in greater because I go to the Father. Well, you can't say that if you're operating as the Son of God because who's going who's gonna to outdo the Son of God? Yeah. Right? That's, that's not possible. So, so there has to be a different resource that he used other than the fact that he's the only begotten Son of God to communicate with God. And God with him. Now, if, if, if we were taking the same path that Jesus took to knowing and seeing God, then we would have to say that we are only aware of God as the Holy Spirit teaches us and reveals him to us. And as the Holy Spirit, he takes the word of God and reveals the word of God to us. 
So we could actually kind of think, well, how did Jesus see it? How did, how did he hear the Father? How did he see the Father? It would have to have been through the fact that as he familiarized himself with the Scriptures, that he was able to observe God's movements in everything that he saw in the Scriptures. He was able to hear the Father's words about him, who he was, what his mission was, what his purpose was, and how to fulfill it, all based on everything that he was taking in from the scriptures that he had available during his time. If he could do it that way, then we can do it that way. And now I know it seems like I'm taking natural efforts to become more spiritual. In essence, you are, but we talked about last week that if you want to become spiritual, you have to take something spiritual into yourself to change you into a more spiritual being or person. And that word, which Jesus said is spirit and is life, is the means by which we take ourselves out of the natural arena and place ourselves into a spiritual arena where we can better communicate with God. And it, it you know, I understand that new birth is a supernatural spiritual experience, but there's a lot of natural things that we can do to make the natural part of our life subdued and the spirit become more prevalent. So this is one of those natural things that you can do to change you spiritually. You can take in, you can feast on, feed on, guarantee that you can't necessarily get revelation from the scriptures by yourself. That's what the Holy Spirit does. But because of the way this dynamic works, we'll go through it in John in just a minute. Before I go there, I told you we'd kind of touch base on that last scripture that we used last week, and that was in 1 Corinthians, and that was uh, 2, 9 through 12. And in it, uh, we see a, that spiritual connection that we have with God by the Holy Spirit, and that that gives us access to the mind of God and God to our spirit. So we can now communicate with, receive from, and be uh, communicated to from God. So the Holy Spirit is God's means of communicating to us and our means of connecting with Him. This is all done by the Holy Spirit. So, and we talked about what a new creature was. Now, I don't know about you, but you know, in today's arena, you think about things that are like evolution and stuff, that, that man came from something else and, um, you know, personally, I, I believe that everything that God's Word says about multiplying after its own kind takes precedence over everything else. I can't come from something that, I, that multiplies after its own kind. Therefore, for me, evolution is impossible because if everything multiplies after its own kind, it cannot become something entirely different. There might be some slight variation and, you know, some adaptation due to its surroundings, but certainly it doesn't become something different. Now, the idea that man, even with all of the technological advances both we have now, and it's kind of funny if you listen over the years, you'll hear people in the past say, because we are so technologically advanced, you know, in the 40s, you know, we have now created the, the nuclear, you know, fusion. This is now the, the cusp of of, you know, of, of new technology and everything. And it's just so funny because we were watching, uh, what was it, uh, a movie about sending a person to the moon and they were like, had all these supercomputers that took up an entire entire floor of this huge building at NASA, you know, and these were all the supercomputers that were used to calculate everything and everything. And they said, today, uh, the amount of technology that is, uh, that, that sent a man on the moon is, is, is less than what you have in your hand and your smartphone. I mean, that's just, that's pretty mind-blowing. But the idea here is that <clears throat> every generation thinks they're just on top of it all, that, that they've all just built on the, on the breakthroughs of every generation before them. None of them are the apex of man's greatest achievements and knowledge. But anyway, the, we don't create anything. We make stuff. <clears throat> we make stuff with stuff that already exists. Only God creates stuff. And this creation, 
and, and to show you the forethought of God, everything that was ever needed or will ever be needed was created back there before anyone knew they needed it. Do you understand how big that sounds? Just to understand how big God is? You know, a few thousand years from then, everything that you needed to create a silicone chip was created, or everything you needed to make a silicone chip was created back then. That's pretty big yeah. to think about. You could, you are God, you could know all that was ever going to be made and create what was necessary to make it before the people that were here to make it even existed. Okay, all right. So maybe that, maybe your mind isn't wrapping itself around that too much. But yeah, let's just boil it back down to the simplistic statement, which is man makes things, and God is the only one who created things. Isn't that right? right. And when we talked about new creation, you, if you say that God is the only one who has created anything, and it's a new creation, which is what we read here in, in 2 Corinthians, that we are a new creation, it doesn't just mean that we are that we were created as far as only God could do that, which we know he did. I'm a new creation. He, he created me. You know, and I've talked about that fusion between the human spirit and God's Holy Spirit as a new creation. It was not only new as in never having been seen before, but it was something God did because he only, he's the only person that creates. So only it was something that even God had never done before. Okay. That's who we are. We are some someone that even God had never done before. New creation. Whole new deal. Amen? Amen? And this new creation was a fusion of the Holy Spirit and my spirit able to now be communicated with and communicate to God without, without hindrance. You know, we, we have that clarity with God now. We have some things in our heads that are still messed up, but as far as spiritually... We have a direct connect. Amen? It's just that you know, our heads are a little messed up. How many said amen? Amen. amen. Yep. And we're getting, we're, getting, we're getting that better too, aren't we? You know, yes. We're getting our head a little more aligned with our spirit, but it takes, it takes teaching. In fact, the scriptures, uh, Paul speaking, he said, uh, for the time that you ought to be teachers, he said, you have need that one teach you again. That is the basic principles of the gospel of Christ. He said, for uh, you need to go back and have milk because... Strong meat is for those who have their senses trained. There needs to be a, a, a training process that we go through that takes what we've had, all of what we've known, all of our previous existence in our minds and our bodies, all of this stuff that we've experienced throughout all of the the time since we've been born has now been. Uh, we now need to retrain. And, and, and only through the consistent application of the principles given to us through God's Word can you really retrain something that has been a lifetime experience in your past. I mean, that sounds great. It, I, we should all be hopeful that we can, we can retrain. I mean, what do they say? Uh, uh, stupid is forever, but uh, I forget how they put it, but it is... If you want to be ignorant, that's something you can't fix. But uh, somebody who doesn't know something can always be repaired. You know, you can change that situation. And so we can change the situation, can't we? There's always hope that we can get retrained out of the way that we were raised, the way that we are, our life experiences and the destiny that that put us to, on uh, a path towards. We can be retrained and that we can now... Uh, enjoy what the Bible calls the divine nature. Amen? A divine nature. That's, that's just, that's just, that's not a step up, that's a leap. Amen? Yes. That's, that's, a, that's a chasm that could not have been uh, achieved any other way than new birth. Alright, so knowing that where we are, and by that word, I just found it in my nose, it's, it's tun, tuna zim. And you're like, what does that mean? If you ever work in a restaurant with, with some Arab people, then you'll know how to say order up. Anyway, uh, we want to be able to, yeah, that's good. That's good to know. All right, so the vocabulary of God is something that we now can begin to impart. If you will, with me, turn to John 16th chapter. 
and uh, this is this is an uh, astounding uh, group of of uh, chapters actually uh, that really teach us different aspects of the Holy Spirit and. Uh, I'm going to zero in on a couple of verses that Jesus gave to us here. We're going to go to the 16th chapter and uh, oops. we're going to look at 14 and 24. They're pretty close. So in the 14th chapter, and, and this was an interesting verse in uh, my version that I was uh, looking, I, I look at several versions all at the same time, and the one that I most liked was God's Word translation, and it said that, uh, in the 14th verse it says, He, speaking of uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, He will give me, speaking, Jesus speaking, He will give me glory because He will tell you what I say. He will tell you what I say. Now, that, that, that may not mean much to you right off the bat, but I need you to understand something here. If you want to uh, really apply yourself spiritually, you have to you have to go above and beyond. And in this case, he gives to you a a means of better communicating with God to understand how God wants to communicate with you and how you can communicate with God. He says, Jesus speaking, says here that the Holy Spirit he will take what I'm saying and he will say it to you. Okay. Now, uh, a lot of times you you don't really understand what somebody's saying to you very well. Sometimes you need somebody that does understand what they're saying to give you a little better explanation of what that person said. And in this case, um, because the Holy Spirit is in us, Jesus, who was with us in the day of ministry, could only speak to us with so much effectiveness. You could hear his words, but sometimes the light bulb on the inside didn't turn on. Amen? Amen. Even today, you could, you could read the Bible. Lots of people have read the Bible, but the light bulb on the inside doesn't turn on. I, I remember us watching a... a, a I, I, don't, I don't know which one it was, probably America's Most Wanted or something like that, you know, and they, they always have at the end, they'll have some, you know, people caught or what have you, and I, I always like that part. How many of you like the part where they catch the bad guy, you know, and, uh, and it'll say, you know, this person was, uh, was, was in their home, and uh, neighbors had recognized them, called in a tip, and authorities showed up, and they were just drinking their coffee, and then they were taken out in handcuffs, you know, as a is a surprise to them. And, and what's most interesting, we saw one of these times where they said this, this mass murderer was, was taken where they were living in the trailer park as they had been sharing weekly Bible studies. And you're like, how does that happen? A, a mass murderer, and I know that you know this is a life changed perhaps, but a lot of times it's just that fusion between the weirdness of Somebody knowing the Bible, but having no a real disconnect in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you ever know anybody? Maybe you've had that in the past. You know, you know somebody that there's they know the Bible, but there's a huge disconnect between what the Bible says about Jesus and His person in our lives, and what you read just knowing the Bible. So just knowing the Bible is what we're talking about. But we are saying, as a believer, I can expand the vocabulary through which God can speak to me and I can understand Him better by inputting a larger vocabulary called the Word of God. That is why Jesus said, He'll take what I've said. Now remember, we talked about Jesus saying, I only say what I hear the Father say and I only do what I hear the Father do. We said, well, the only way that He could do that as a man is to have seen it throughout the Scriptures and receive from the Holy Spirit thereafter. God couldn't show him any respecter of persons, couldn't treat him any differently than he would you and I, and then expect us to do the same thing he did. Right? Yes. So we understand one another. There's, there's, there had to be that cooperative work of the Word and the Holy Spirit for Jesus to understand the Father, what he was doing, what he was saying, and what he wanted him to do. And it's the same for us. We still depend on the Holy Spirit, 
but that's what Jesus said he was there for. But you still have a part to play in expanding your vocabulary of how God can speak to you. If you really want God to speak to you, if you're just, you want to be a, a real turned on, sold out, fired up child of God, I'm giving you a simple key. Not everyone will do it. That's, there's no guarantee you'll do it. There's no guarantee I will do it. But it is guaranteed to work. Whether we do it or not. Because it's illustrated for us in the successful ministry of Jesus Christ. In that he was able to discern what God wanted him to do. He was able to hear from heaven accurately. He was able to receive leadership and guidance. Every miracle has a correlation with something he saw in the word of God already. You say, oh, I can name several miracles that I don't see in the Old Testament. Well, you might be able to name the specifics are a little different. But the underlying proof that, that what you saw in the ministry of Jesus could be done was already illustrated in something shown in the Old Testament. You know, I just stopped and I thought about it. I thought about, you know, feeding 5,000. You know, where do you see that in the Bible? You know, you know, you see plenty of illustrations of whether it's the prophet who comes and the, the oil that never stops flowing or the flower that doesn't stop. And, you know, it, there's always this kind of a, yeah, I have, if you were Jesus, you'd say, I have the right to, to be assured that this is where you're leading me because I've seen you lead, it, lead someone here before. It's illustrated for me in some way, shape, or form throughout the scriptures before. And this is why Jesus said, you know, the works that I do shall you do also because they're illustrated for us in the Gospels. And I, I personally, this is my personal thing, but I personally believe that, that if you really want to hear from Jesus, you want to go to the Gospels. You know, personally, I believe that's the most uh, simplistic and straightforward way to hear from both the Father and the Son is through the Gospels. There's so much in there. In fact, the Scriptures say that if everything that Jesus said and did the, was recorded, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it. Which, in some cases, sounds like a cop-out. Where's the rest of the good stuff? But the reality is, is that when my mama used to make orange juice, as gross as it was, it was from concentrate in a can. And it always tasted like a a little bit of cardboard because it came from a cardboard can. But the idea here is that concentrated stuff means you can take a little bit of it and it really would go a long way. And so we don't need more information. We don't make good use of what we have. Right? We, we've got to concentrate. In other words, if everything he said would have been written, we wouldn't have enough room for it. So that means that everything that is written must be concentrated, must be very important, right? Right. So we, and even then we like to forget about the fact that Matthew starts out with a bunch of stuff we don't like to read. But you know what? It, it, you know, these things are in there, and there could have been a lot of other things in there, but they chose not to put them in there. So what's in there is of great importance. So take the words that you see in the Gospels and pour them into yourself to expand your vocabulary of a different language. God's speaking a different language to us than we've heard for the years of our lives past. And that is the supernatural. But in order to have a vocabulary with which God can challenge us and communicate to us, we need to have a different vocabulary. One that believes in things we couldn't believe in before. One that easily and readily accepts a challenge from God's Holy Spirit to go where we've not gone before. These kind of things would be impossible with a limited vocabulary but with a broader vocabulary of having poured into ourselves the Word of God consistently for the very purpose alone of hearing God better and being able to, uh, uh, be, uh, being able to, to, to put your finger on what God said more quickly, readily, easily, to identify God's voice among the many others that we have going in and through our lives. We need to expand our vocabulary. Amen? And to do that, he's given us everything we need to be able to better identify and to articulate what God is saying through us as well. The ministry of Jesus was the sum total of every glimpse of God observed in the words and deeds throughout the scriptures for him. 
That's how he was able to have the confidence to do what he did. Now, he didn't just hear it from heaven. He saw it. He saw it not just in the fact that God had put it before him, but God had put it before him in the form of every other experience that every prophet and teacher had already exemplified throughout the Old Covenant. We can do the same thing. This is where we can, we can measure up. We can, we can man up. We don't have to just ask God to just kind of like flow over us and maybe get some tingly feeling that suddenly makes us changed into some better person. We can actually man up and expand our vocabulary to think, act, and be able to, uh, not articulate, but understand better what God is saying to us. All right, quickly, uh, Psalms 119. I'm sorry, I didn't go to the other, the other part. In God's Word translation, again, in the 24th verse, can you look at that real quickly? 24th verse, it's the 16th chapter. He says, However, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you everything. And listen to this. Listen to this. He will remind you of everything that I've ever told you. Okay, now, in, in, in His time, He was talking for three years, and you could easily forget what He said last week. You know? So, they were getting like this recording of Jesus all the time. And it was coming on the inside of them, but they're, they didn't have the ability spiritually or any other way to recall these marvelous experiences. In fact, if you really look at this, it's saying this is how the Gospels were written. The Gospels were written because when the Holy Spirit came, they were able to supernaturally recount the experiences, and in sometimes, in John's case, a huge amount of Holy Spirit uh, exposition was given with the remembrance of the details of the ministry of Jesus. So you're actually seeing how the Gospels were written before they were written when Jesus said, hey, he's going to come and he's going to enable you to be able to recount, to re recollect to bring to your remembrance everything that I've said to you. And that just wasn't for the disciples. But what I'm saying is that those that was the context in that moment. The context for us today is that the Gospels were a rewrite of everything Jesus did and said. Now, he did and said only what he heard the Father do and say. So we know that this is kind of a funnel effect and that we are getting everything from the, the beginnings of man's experiences with God to right now are all still relevant to us through what Jesus has said in the Gospels. Because everything he said was a funnel down from an old covenant, and everything that the Gospels say to us is a funnel down from that. So we, we have this, this apex of, of Christian experience where all of time and space and its relation to God has been connecting, is intersecting with us at this time to cause us to better know God and His ways when we apply ourselves to pouring the words of Jesus into that, so the Holy into us, so the Holy Spirit can bring that back out of us and help our understanding to change because of it. Amen? But most of the time, people want God to change their understanding. They want God to deal with the brain. They want God to change their mind and their attitude. Look, He changes hearts. A lot of times it's up to you to change your attitude. Amen? I mean, he's changed our heart. There's no reason we should have a bad attitude. But we still get bad attitudes, even with a changed heart. Because our minds still need to be renovated. And that's where the Holy Spirit takes something that Jesus says. And he brings it back to your mind. And there becomes this conflict about the way I'm thinking. And the way that this word now has portrayed what I'm supposed to be. Or I actually now am, but I'm not emulating. Amen? Amen? And then we have a choice to make. Right? But that's the Holy Spirit. He does that. But He only does that if you give Him only a couple of scriptures a month to work with. That's not much for Him to work with, to communicate with you about. Amen? I'm not dissing your couple of scriptures a, a month. I'm just saying, 
if you want to be able to hear from and accurately hear from God better and more frequently, you have to expand the vocabulary. That comes by you putting, the more you put in, the more he will bring to your remembrance. Amen? Amen. All right, so that's something we can do. Everybody say, I can do that. I can do that. Yeah. Now, see, I didn't have to say, I didn't make you say, I will do that, because I know you're like, oh, I don't know. But you know what? I can do that. Amen? And that's the first step that I'm here to help you take. Um, briefly, I'm just going to breeze through uh, this Psalms 119, 130. And it says this, so I won't make you turn there. Um, but it says this, the entrance of thy word, or the entrance of your words, and depending on what version, this is the New King James, the entrance of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. I know we don't want to be like calling it. Did the Bible really call me simple? Well, I don't know. Take it for what it is. The word is better translated naive or inexperienced. I think we could all go for that, right? But the entrance of the word of God brings light to the simple, to those who are inexperienced or naive. The entrance, what does that mean? You see, when I'm looking to hear from God, I'm looking to hear, you know, in a, I try to put myself in a silent place. So that I'm, I'm not just getting God, when I was in school, I used to like to take tests that give you multiple choice. A, B, or C. How many of you like multiple choice? Because you feel like somewhere in there is the answer. What I didn't like was when they said A, B, C, or D. D was always none of the above, which always bothered me because it made me second guess whether or not A, B, or C was the answer. And then it made me angry. It made me angry because I decided, well, why did you make me read A, B, and C if you knew that the answer wasn't even there? Amen? Amen. So here's what we often do. We go to God and we give him a multiple choice. So God, make it easier on God. You know, like, if you're going to talk to me, tell me. Should I do this or should I do that? The question is, what if it was D, none of the above? See, we, we can't just say, I want to hear from God if it's A, B, or C. You have to be willing to just blank the sheet out and say, okay, so-and-so says this, so-and-so, that's what I do. I say, so-and-so says this, so-and-so says that, but what do you say? I'm not discounting that there's some good ideas out there and some people that I respect that have given me some input. But ultimately, what do you say? I don't just let God speak to me about A, B, and C. As much as it pains me, I don't really like D. But I just wipe them all clean. I say, so-and-so says this, so-and-so says this, what do you say? The entrance of thy word gives light. In other words, usually, if you can clear out a bunch of the garbage that's being you know, circulated in your mind, clear it out, and you say, God, the one thing that you say to me, I believe it will bring light. I believe that it will come by revelation. In other words, it's not necessarily what I want, because I do believe if you always hear what you want from God, that you're probably not hearing God. Right? God wants me to have that Ferrari. God wants me to have my neighbor's wife. God wants me to have, you know, all these kind of things. And you're like, do you always hear what you want to hear? Because if you do, I question whether or not you're ever really hearing from God. And you can't be always hearing from God for what you want and it always be God. So what I say is, according to the scripture, the entrance of thy word gives light. In other words, it's that, that, that what otherwise wouldn't have been even an angle on what you were approaching in prayer. What you were talking to God about, and you were like, I would have never seen it that way. That's a, that's a new perspective for me on this. How do I look at this situation? And, and if you get a fresh and new perspective, and if, even better if you got it because you got a spirit, you know, a, a, a spirit-led scripture, that you got with it, but, but the idea is when you get that inward enlightenment about something, an angle of looking at it and a perspective that you know is from above, 
and you're like, that is something I would not have thought of doing for that person. You know, quickly, give an example, you know. Somebody does you wrong. You know, all your mind is, you're, you're trying to figure out how you can forgive them because it's all about you. You never really think about the person, why they did what they did. Maybe they're hurting. Maybe they're, maybe they're in, a, in a bind. Maybe their situation is so much worse than yours could ever be. And because you were offended, you thought that your situation is the most important. Sometimes, if you just quiet yourself and you let God speak to you, He will actually speak to you in revelation. In other words, something that you had not otherwise been thinking, and you'll know that you know that you know it's God because you wouldn't have had a simple thought, a sympathetic, you know, sympathetic thought for that person or that situation if it weren't for God giving it to you. Amen. So look for that. Look for that different perspective. Look for that. That totally, if you can blank. You know, your slate, as it were, on the inside of your heart. And let God speak to you. You'll be amazed that He'll speak by revelation. Something that you had not been even looking for or at before. Amen? Because that's what the entrance of the Word does. It gives light. Amen? Alright, that doesn't put the end to the subject on hearing from God. Because it's too broad a subject. So perhaps we'll continue it next week. We've already done more than enough time on it today. But thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that some of the things that we shared with you give to you some things you can do and some ways that you can improve your hearing from God. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Father, by your Holy Spirit, thank you that you make of some of the stuff that's said, you, you take out the most important stuff and make it vibrant to us and give us something out of it. Thank you for those words and your scriptures that you've given to us that can also help to give us guidance in the times where we need to hear from you and want to hear from you. I thank you also, God, that it's just by your spirit that we have any of this privilege. And that because, Holy Spirit, you are our contact between God and us. I thank you that you are just making the most of every opportunity. When we draw nigh to you, you draw nigh to us. And I thank you, God, you always are the asking, the seeking, and the knocking of your children. Any attempt to make spiritual progress is always met with reward. And I thank you, God, in Jesus' name for that. Amen. Amen. How many believe that? Yes. It's been, it's been my, my monthly encouragement to us. Ask, seek, and knock. Every attempt to make spiritual progress is always met with reward, isn't it? Amen. Amen. All right, well, God bless you. Let's receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Catherine, if you would put... Uh, just a good believing on today's offering for people's <clears throat> gifts. Amen. Father, I just praise you and thank you for your love and mercy and for this word today. And I just um, ask that you bless the giver today and those who um, don't have to give, that you would bless them with uh, prosperity and job and with um, your benefits and I just praise you and thank you for it and thank you for um, all your many blessings and your our source and our provider and our trust is in no other in Jesus name Amen. Amen. Let me be faithful to, uh, to, to remind you about some of our friends and partners in the kingdom of God here who have asked for prayer Michelle has, uh, she hurt her foot, and she asked for prayer, um, so we want to pray for her. Um, I know Mike and Teresa are in travels, and, and we, we commit ourselves to continue to pray for God's best for them, their family, and for the travels. How about you guys? Anybody uh, got something that you'd like to add to these prayers before we go? Mm -hmm. Anything? For you personally? Or? Personally, for yes. uh, lower, lower my blood pressure. Very true. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Uh, financial stability. <laughs> stability. Need, yeah, we need money. Right. Anyone else? Father God, we just pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we just believe you, Father, for every 